Welcome. This panel is directed towards um, specifically the PhD in Gerontology program here at the USC Leonard Davis School of Gerontology. Um, the program is fully funded and revolves around examining social policies, um, sociological impacts, uh, specifically on the lifespan, and we study the lifespan um, across the aging process all the way from, you know, birth and adolescence to, to death. Um, and today we're going to focus directly on this program. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our panelist, Dr. Jennifer Alshire. Jennifer is the chair of the faculty committee for the PhD in gerontology program and an associate professor of gerontology and sociology. She completed her PhD in sociology demography from the University of Michigan. Some of her research interests include social demography, social relationships, aging and the life course, neighborhoods and health, health disparities, and social determinants of health. Some of her current projects focus on researching the links between air pollution and health in older adults, neighborhood determinants of racial and ethnic health disparities, and social factors associated with poor sleep. So without further ado, welcome, Jennifer. Hi. Great, so we're gonna move directly into some of our questions. So you work with the PhD in gerontology program and the committee that uh, does acceptance of these applications. Can you kind of give us an insight into what some of the reviewers and the committee are looking for on the application? Uh, yep, just as a kind of general overview, the way this works is all of the application materials are due in um, you have a December deadline. You know, sometimes we don't have all of the application materials on hand. Maybe we have unofficial transcripts, but we haven't gotten the official transcripts. We may be waiting on some scores or letters, but in general, we expect to have all of the materials that we need to meet in early December to evaluate the pool of applications. Um, the admissions committee consists of a rotating group of faculty who all work uh, with PhD students or teach in the PhD program, uh, which is just to say that the admissions review is done completely by faculty. So we have uh, administrators there like Stephen who help us out through the process, but the, the review is done by um, the PhD faculty. Uh, we actually have two programs I just wanted to make clear, and you've probably seen this on the website or heard from any of our admissions counselors. We have one that's focused on the biology of aging, uh, and our program, the one that I'm representing today and talking to you about, is the gerontology program. Sometimes we get applicants into the gerontology program that are much better suited for the biology of aging program. I think sometimes it's a kind of a clerical error, but sometimes students aren't entirely clear what the difference is between the two programs. Um, so if any of you have questions about that, I'd be happy to uh, answer it today. But in, generally speaking, uh, we are not a lab-based PhD research program in gerontology. Uh, so we do use the, the kind of lab terminology to describe what are actually research working groups. But none of us are working with mice or cells or fruit flies or worms or any other um, kind of model, model organism to do our research. Also, our PhD program is a multidisciplinary program. So I think our PhD program has a lot of really unique elements, but two that I think are really important for people who are considering getting a PhD in gerontology is that we are one of the only PhD granting institutions in the world. Uh, we're the only school of gerontology at this point. I think maybe a couple are starting, perhaps in Taiwan or China. Um, so that's a kind of a unique aspect of our PhD program. There are some other programs where you can get gerontology PhDs, but we're the only school of gerontology. And so we, we really do have a very strong national and international reputation. But the other unique feature, which is not unique to our school, but is unique to the field of gerontology, is that it's very multidisciplinary. So I know that someone submitted a question asking what kinds of backgrounds are best suited for um, being in a PhD in gerontology program. Um, but the thing is that gerontology is a very broad umbrella. Uh, a lot of us are working in the field of aging and gerontological research coming from very different backgrounds. And so even in the School of Gerontology, we have a mixture of biological scientists, um, neuroimaging scientists, I'm a social scientist, we have people who work more in policy. So um, we, we've had people from a pretty diverse range of backgrounds. Um, 
psychology, sociology are pretty common. Uh, we also have people who come in with public health degrees. That's fairly common as well. But we've had people with um, undergrads in uh, grad undergraduate degrees in music, um, finance, so a lot of kind of different um, seemingly unrelated disciplines. But these were people who were really committed to pursuing research on aging or to pursuing a career that required research in terms of uh, gerontological setting. Um, so I think just a couple other really quick general points about the program. Uh, any PhD program is training people to become researchers. So what sets us apart a, a, someone with a PhD versus someone with another advanced degree, like an MD or a, a JD, a lawyer, for instance, is that those of us with a PhD are trained to do a rigorous top-notch research. And that's what we do in our program. So, um, you know, if people are looking to become like healthcare administrators, um, to run facilities, to, to kind of work more in like a community settings that aren't directly um, related to research. We have master's programs that are really well suited uh, for those kinds of career placements. But the PhD program is really for people who are planning to uh, get training in research and to pursue a career in research, which doesn't mean that we expect all of our students to go on to work as professors. And in fact, we've had students that have gone on to a variety of uh, careers, including people who work for the World Health Organization. We have a PhD who works for um, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid um, uh, Organization for Innovations. And we have people who work in foundations, but you can kind of see the theme across all of those non-academic careers is that those people are still very much engaged in research in one way or another. So the big um, point that I'm making is that this is a research training program. Most of our grads take about five years uh, on average. Some people take four years, they can finish really quickly. And some people take um, six years, which is pretty normal. Um, and our, uh, the people in our PhD programs are fully funded. That's a requirement that we have through the graduate school at USC. And what that means is that every person that we admit, we're committing to providing four to five years of funding through RA ships or TA ships. And of course, a lot of our students apply and are very successful at getting fellowship funding, um, NIH funding, NSF funding. Um, but that's just to say that we, we make a financial commitment to our students in the program. That does mean that unlike other programs, we tend to enroll a smaller cohort of PhD students because we don't enroll students and then expect them to find their own funding. We're really committing to them. Um, we also commit to some pretty um, close training with the professors. And that's another reason why we tend to have smaller cohorts than some of the other programs. Um, so I think that's it for kind of a general overview of the program. And Stephen, I don't know if you wanna, if, if we're going to just take questions here, or if we should start going through the questions you've already received, but I'll leave that up to you for organizational. Yeah, let's start going through some of the questions that are received. And then if any students have any other questions about what they hear or can think of, please put it in the chat and um, we'll work it into our conversation as well. Um, so Jennifer, kind of on the application process, you the students are required to submit a, a couple of different documents, one of them being a sample of their writing. Can you explain what the committee is looking for on that sample of their writing? Yeah, again, because this is a, a program that is designed to train people in research and has an expectation that people will be engaged in research, that's also what the, the review committee is typically looking for in the applications. So, it, you know, if you have different writing samples that you can choose from and, and you have writing samples that you think might better demonstrate your capacity for research, um, and I say capacity for instead of enthusiasm for, because you might be passionate about something, but if you have a writing sample that shows that you actually know what research means, you know what it means to research a topic, um, which could be like a critical lit review. It doesn't have to be um, like a primary research paper. It certainly doesn't need to be any kind of a published article, but the committee is really looking for in all elements of the application, signs that the applicant um, understands what it means to conduct research and is well suited uh, to get continued and ongoing training in research. Wonderful. And is that student expected to be the primary author, a contributing author, or does it make a difference? Yeah, so sometimes we do get like published papers from people. Those are a little harder to evaluate. I think if you do that, you'll want to make sure in your personal statement that you make it very clear what your role was on that paper. 
um, you, cause you could have had a very significant role in the research process of it. Um, I, I think also, Stephen, you're bringing up another interesting point, which is that you might submit a writing, because you can submit multiple um, pieces of work. You can submit a writing sample that really demonstrates your writing ability. You could submit something else that was perhaps um, more research oriented and say, I did the lab work or um, I did the data work for this. I did the lit review for this paper. Um, so I, I think the general statement is just to focus on submitting um, evidence of your capacity for conducting research. Mm -hmm. Great. And then you mentioned about a statement of purpose and in there identifying professors that you'd be interested in working with. Can you explain um, to what capacity students are responsible for identifying professors that they want to work with during the duration of their program? Um, sure. So at the application stage, we can, we can make a guess at which professors we think would be a good fit for the student. Um, it's not really that we're trying to find a fit with a professor because, of course, students can switch professors over the course of their time in the program. It's more that we're trying to understand if the student is a good fit for the program and the professors kind of embody the different aspects of the program. Um, but I would encourage people to do research on the website to see um, what kind of areas of research different professors are engaged in. And if you think that there's a good fit, you can list one, two, I, I think you can list up to three people. Um, but it, when people don't list a professor, we kind of just think like, oh, this person's probably a good fit for X, Y, or Z person. And actually sometimes people list a professor and then we look through their materials and we think they're actually a better fit um, based on what they have put in their materials and their background for a different professor. So it's not, it's not essential that you list a professor, but it does help us a lot to try to get a sense of where the student is coming from, where they want to go, so that we can evaluate um, with better information whether the student um, is a good fit for the program. And importantly, I want to also make it very clear, we're trying to evaluate whether the program is a good fit for the student. So, um, you know, it goes both ways for sure. Wonderful. And so once you have identified that professor and the committee has identified the professor that best fits the student, how does that work throughout the duration of the program from classes to completion of your dissertation? Uh, so we, we have a schedule of required courses that are designed to prepare students to take and pass, hopefully their qualifying exams. You start, uh, the courses are offered uh, two, well, one a semester, so you take two in one year and two in the other. Um, so you're taking classes with your cohort members, and then the first year you're taking classes with the cohort ahead of you, and in your second year you take classes with the cohort behind you. Um, after that, and then you have the opportunity to take a lot of elective courses as well. That's really important for our students because our students are very, um, we have a lot of diversity in the kind of students that we have. So some students may go on to take advanced statistics courses and others may take qualitative methods um, courses because they want to engage in qualitative research. Um, and some students take other health related classes and others take policy classes, for instance. Um, so a lot of times our students do come into the program and they're kind of connected with a professor to start with and that's a the professor they work with for the duration in their program. Um, but we do a little more kind of team um, sort of research oriented collaborations as well. So just an example, as one example, um, there was a student, she's going to be beginning her third year. She started in the program working with Liz Zielinski. That's her primary faculty advisor. Liz Zielinski is a psychologist. Um, the student came to me because she was interested in doing some neighborhood research. I'm not a psychologist, um, but I do neighborhood research. And so she and I started working together and she's now a research assistant on a couple of my research projects. Um, she's not my student, but we're, we're in fact finishing a paper we're going to be submitting this week on loneliness among older adults um, that's related to kind of COVID social distancing coping behaviors. So um, just being assigned to a faculty member doesn't mean that much necessarily. It's almost kind of an administrative issue <laughs> that we have to do in the school. Um, but we really, uh, we also have students who work with faculty in our school. They have kind of like your primary mentor, um, but they're also working with faculty at the med campus. So there's the dean of the medical school does work on elder abuse. And we have students who are working on her. She's got some big funded research projects. So our students 
also work with faculty outside of the program and we encourage that as well. And I think that again, it's just because we're so multidisciplinary and each of our students are so unique that we're pretty flexible in the PhD program in terms of trying to make sure that our students get all of the kind of academic and intellectual support and resources that they need, however that might look. Um, but yeah, I mean, so it does happen sometimes that people start with one faculty member and they switch to another one. Mm -hmm. uh, and we also have students who have kind of an equal, like um, like a, almost a 50-50 split. They're working with two faculty members and they're doing it very, like it's, it's a very kind of even relationship between the two different faculty members. So we have a lot of different models in the school. I guess that's kind of a, a very hard question to answer <laughs> with like any kind of short, simple answer. It, it depends. I should have said it depends. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is, but it brings in a lot of uh, cross collaboration between kind of different disciplinaries mm -hmm. of gerontology. So can you explain how some of the funding goes towards, you know, working with those different professors if you're not specifically with just one? Um, yes, and I should have also mentioned that um, none of our PhD students ever pay any tuition while they're in the program. So USC has a kind of a unique tuition model for PhD students. Um, so it's not, it's not really part of the funding package. You're, you're basically tuition free the entire time. Before the dissertation, after the dissertation, there's never any tuition. It doesn't mean that tuition doesn't ever get charged, but that's an accounting issue and it's not something that ever affects students. Mm -hmm. um, so the funding packages are, again, they kind of vary by students. We have students, as I said, who end up getting NSF funding, and that's like two or three years, depending on what kind of NSF funding you get. Some of our students get fellowships from the graduate school, and that's a couple years of funding. Um, some students have been kind of funded all the way through, and they don't TA that much. They're not really teaching. Uh, and other students are spending a lot more time teaching. I think that also kind of depends on the ultimate goal of the student, though. So when we get students who are um, looking to get an academic faculty position, we do encourage them to get some training teaching while they're in the PhD program. And some of those students end up even perhaps teaching their own class, but we usually only allow that towards the end of the program after they've finished all of their other requirements. Um, but in, in general, it's pretty unique. And each student has a, a very personalized four or five year funding package. Um, but basically all of our faculty have these funded research programs and I would say the bulk of the students are funded on those kinds of projects with the exception of students who are TAing a bit more. Wonderful. So then, um, you said Oh, I should also say, sorry, really quickly, Go ahead. whether you're TAing or RAing, it's 20 hours a week, not one minute over. So you're being paid kind of a full-time salary but you're only working in a sense part-time because the expectation is you spend the other 20 hours either on coursework in your first couple of years or working on your dissertation in the last few years. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So then with that 20 hours of coursework guaranteed per week, um, is the program fully residential or required to be residential throughout the duration? Normally, yes. So long as you're uh, doing coursework, you're expected to be on campus. Right now, obviously, things have changed. So we're not a residential program. That's very much in response to COVID. Um, that will probably mean that for the duration of this year, all of our PhD classes are going to be held online. I don't know what's going to happen next year, but um, if we're not you know, in a great situation, the cohort starting next year may also start online. So we have a cohort of PhD students this year who's not going to be in residence, technically speaking. Mm -hmm. um, what typically happens though, Stephen, is that after completing coursework and after passing the qualifying exam when students enter the dissertation stage and they've often obtained some kind of external funding, um, we have a lot of students who do move, um, usually because of family related reasons. Uh, you know, a, a partner got a job or something happened. Um, or they had a child and they wanted to be closer to family. At that stage in PhD training, it's a lot easier to be at a distance, I think, because you're not required to be doing coursework. Um, of course, that's all individual as well, and some people really do much better, you know, kind of being in the lab environment. Um, so we, it's, it's expected to be a residential program, but there's, um, after the in-person class requirement has been completed, there is some flexibility. Um, but again, that's kind of something that gets decided between the student and their advisor or whoever's providing funding for them. Mm -hmm. 
Can you talk briefly about some of the other labs that um, students can go into in this program? Um, sure. So um, we have two people who work more on the kind of uh, neuroimaging neuroscience side of things. It's Mara Mather and Andre Rima. Um, so Andre does a lot of brain imaging work. It's very um, computational. Um, Mara does uh, some lab-based work, actually. She brings people in and stress tests them and then you know, does little memory experiments with them. Um, Liz Zielinski is a, another, oh, we have a new psychologist, Teal Ike. She also does experimental um, kind of work. And I think she may also do what we call secondary data analysis, where she just does statistical analysis of data that have already been collected. Um, Liz Zielinski is another psychologist, so she doesn't run her own studies, although she was involved in a really large scale data collection study here in Southern California. Uh, but she does a lot of secondary data analysis um, and she's very focused on cognition. So Mara's focused, Andre's focused on the brain and traumatic injury. Mara's focused on memory. Uh, I couldn't tell you exactly what Teal does because she's still a bit new and I haven't um, spent that much time with her. Um, but <clears throat> beyond that, we have kind of what we would call sort of our policy cluster, although I don't know that I would really say that they all kind of fit under the same umbrella. Um, but we have new hires, Marie Jacob Jacobson, who's an economist. So she does a lot of um, kind of cool studies trying to like use experimental approaches to understand how to package information about selecting Medicare plans for older adults to um, facilitate um, that process, which turns out is like just really complicated. And even with a PhD, people probably have a hard time figuring it out. Um, our other new hire in that area is um, Reggie Tucker Seeley, and he does a lot of work on um, kind of diverse communities and public health and public policy approaches to improving health and vulnerable minority populations. Uh, Kate Wilbur has a lab focused on elder care, but she also has a lot, quite a few side projects. I mean, they're not side projects, no, I think they're actually main projects that are focused a little more on age-friendly um, age friendly cities, age-friendly um, living designs. And she works with the LA Department of Public Health actually on the the mayor's age-friendly LA project. Um, Susan Nguidenos has a pretty big lab as well. She does a lot of work on, um, I, I think she's kind of split almost, ha sort of half and half between just kind of end-of-life care, palliative care in general, sort of health systems delivery uh, on the other hand. So she has often a lot of different projects going on. And so she has several students who are working on really a variety of different projects. Um, and then John Pinus does work on, primarily on home modifications. Um, and he has some kind of uh, projects going on through the Fall Prevention Center. And there's myself. And then the last person is Eileen Crimmins, who runs the USC UCLA, sorry, the UCL, USC, yes, USC UCLA Center on Biodemography and Population Health. She runs it with um, Teresa Seaman over at UCLA, who's in uh, geriatric medicine there. And she does a lot of our um, kind of international work. Uh, and then the other two hires in that sort of social science population area are Jessica Ho, who's done a lot of work on the opioid epidemic. She's, we consider her a mortality expert. She really tries to understand the, um, what's going on with patterns of mortality around the United States. She's done work in other countries as well, like Indonesia. Uh, and then the last person is Joseph Sainz who works um, primarily on Latino health, both here in the United States and in Mexico. Wonderful. So it sounds like there's a lot of different faculty members that work in, say, social sciences, neuroscience, psychology, policy. So what kind of background for a potential candidate would you recommend? What kind of bachelor's degree or research experience? Right. So I think for every professor, it's going to depend quite a bit on what kind of work they do. So for instance, I've, I, we have, I don't know if the students know this, but after, and I probably should have explained this in the application process, we actually select about a dozen or so people to come visit USC. I don't know what we're going to do this year, to be honest. We haven't, we can't even think that far ahead, but usually there's a campus visit and that provides an opportunity for us to get to know the students and for the students to get to know us. So during some of these visits, there have been times when I've spoken with students, for instance, um, and it's become really clear that they have research interests that aren't very well aligned with my own, which is not to say that what they're interested in isn't 
super fascinating. It's just that maybe after that conversation and looking at their materials, I don't feel like I could train them. I, I don't feel like I have the capacity um, to give them what they need uh, to meet their goals. I think that probably happens with all of the professors who are, you know, we're trying to find a really good match. We have actually, I think, probably one of the more successful PhD programs I know of, meaning we don't have a lot of people dropping out. We don't have a lot of issues in the program. We have very success, high success and completion rates. I think it's because we do this really close, um, well thought out match early on. So, you know, what you should have kind of in preparation sort of depends on who you're thinking of working with. I can tell you up front, Marie Jacobson is a health economist. She, like me, also does not have any capacity to train people in qualitative research methods, ethnographies, things like that, right? Um, on the other hand, I think someone who's doing a lot of kind of population work may not be the best fit in Mar Matters Lab because she wants someone who's going to have good um, experimental data collection skills. So uh, it kind of depends on which person we're talking about, but I think that having good writing skills and data analysis skills usually are um, present in most of our successful applicants. Wonderful, great. And then for applicants, um, do they need any sort of research experience to apply? And if, if so, is it kind of geared towards what they've been interested in the past or what they want to do in the future? So I wouldn't say that you need research experience. I think that you could probably demonstrate a propensity for research without necessarily having an experience, right? Because perhaps you've taken research methods classes, you've taken statistics coursework, you've written term papers. Um, but I do think that a lot of our applicants tend to have some kind of experience. Um, and it probably helps a little bit. Um, like I said, I think that, you know, you're making a five minute, five year commitment to someone and you wanna make sure that you're committing to the people that are going to benefit most from the training and that are going to be the best fit. And it is probably the case that having some kind of signal that one is prepared for high level research training is a, an advantage during the application process. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So then um, kind of like this vast background that students can apply with and specialize in within the program, where do you see a lot of um, PhDs go into after their program? Do they go into more academia? Do they go into industry? Um, does one lean heavily or towards the other? Um, I think off the top of my head, we probably have something like 70 to 80 percent of our PhD um, completed people who've gotten their PhD go into academic jobs. So they become professors. Um, they, they go to primarily research universities. Um, we've had some people go to the Cal States here locally and, and we've placed people in universities actually all over the world. Um, but as I said, we do also have some people who have gone into non-academic research settings. So working for those organizations I mentioned earlier. Um, we've had just a handful of people, like a couple of people who have gone into industry. Um, but I, I think probably if we looked at every single one of our graduates, no matter where they are, they're, they're somehow engaged in the production or evaluation of research. Great, wonderful. So students that decide to stay in academia and um, say in, while they're in the program, they want to attend conferences, get grants, whatnot. How does the program help them either in grant writing or attend different conferences? Um, so our PhD program provides funding for the PhD students to attend the annual meeting of the Gerontology um, Society of America, which is um, kind of amazing. Most PhD programs are not as generous as our program is, but fortunately, Maria Henke, um, who administers all of our academic programs, is very committed to the success of our students, which is amazing. And so students get, um, and they don't just get, again, I don't know what's going to happen in the future <laughs> because everything seems up in there, but at least in the past, Maria has been very generous with our students. It's not just that she provides financial support for our PhD students to attend GSA, but it, it's been more than um, any other program that I know of that supports students. 
Um, we do encourage our students to attend conferences. We think it's an important part, not only of their research development, but the professionalization and networking that's so necessary to have successful careers. Um, and we provide a lot of financial support so that our students aren't bearing the costs of um, those conferences. And this was like a memory test for me because there was something else in your question that I, what was the other thing you said? Um, well, we can go into how does the program help them with publishing, say, articles for magazines and publications? Um, oh, oh, no, you asked about grants, Stephen. I do want to say we also have a pre-awards grant administrator, Linda Hall, who is phenomenal. She's the nicest person. She, she, she actually um, helps all of us submit our grants, whether we're faculty, staff, or students. Um, but students get the exact same amount of attention from her that a faculty person gets. And I think that's so helpful to students who are trying to submit a grant that they've never done it before. Usually we want you to write the grants with your faculty members. That makes the grant more successful. Um, but Linda's really good at all of the kind of nuts and bolts because you know it's one thing to write the science, it's another thing to write a grant. Those are grant writing is kind of a different skill. Um, we do encourage grant writing skill sets in our students, and we actually offer a class that Liz Zielinski teaches for advanced grad students and postdocs on grant writing. Um, so we have a lot of in-house support for writing grants. And we have a lot of faculty who serve on, for instance, the review panels at NIH that review these kind of grants. So like I review um, the PhD student grants uh, that go to the National Institute on Aging. Um, in terms of publishing, so we do have a publishable paper requirement in the program. So um, I think there we also kind of excel at uh, helping make sure that our graduates are all leaving uh, the program with quite a few publications, which we think will make them more successful because people are just cranking out articles these days. Um, but I think it helps that because we have so many faculty who are engaged in research and are themselves very actively publishing, that's a good model for uh, grad students. Um, and I always encourage grad students actually to work with each other as well. So one of my grad students is working with another faculty student on a paper um, because I think it's, it's a good kind of another, just sort of a different experience in terms of publishing. Um, but yeah, all of our students and usually have a publication at least by the time they graduate. And we've had some super stellar students who have just had like a ton of publications. Um, so they're special, but we try to help them along the way. Um, but yeah, I think we do, we have high expectations of our students, I'm not going to lie, like we really do expect um, a lot of output from the students. But the most important thing is we accompany that expectation with a tremendous amount of uh, support and a lot of resources as well. And I think it's made for, a, that's, that's been a good recipe for success for our students and our faculty. Yes, definitely. The school is more like a community where you can reach out to any sort of faculty member or staff member for a question. And if they don't have the answer, they can definitely direct you towards the right person that might have the answer. So, yeah, I mean, I don't know if it's because we work in gerontology. So we've all studied like intergenerational relations and housing and cohort cohort change. Um, but we this program is much more of a community and a family than other programs that I've been affiliated with or that I know of. Of course, this is not true at the moment, but in general, most of our faculty have these kind of open door policies where students just kind of pop in on us. We're okay with that. Um, and there's a, I think there's a lot more interaction between faculty and PhD students than uh, certainly more than I had in my PhD program. Um, because we're a smaller school, our students also interact with the dean, which is unheard of. Our dean is this kind of funny, uh, you know, fun, nice guy. Um, and everyone has a lot of interaction with Maria Henke as well, who's sort of like, I don't know how she'll feel about me saying this. I think it's accurate. She's like the school mom. She's everyone's mom. She's looking out for everyone. Um, and then, of course, there are always people like Stephen and people like Linda who are down on the first floor in the business office and the administrative offices that students can always pop in and get help when they need it. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So can you talk a little about the advising during the duration of the program and how it kind of shifts from kind of the beginning where you're getting to know your advisor and take classes to kind of the end and completion of the PhD dissertation? Um, yeah, I think probably most people, so when our, uh, the first year of the program, the students are on kind of a fellowship, so you're not TA and you're not you might be working on research projects, but it's not an obligatory kind of thing. And we do that because we want to give people a year to sort of focus on their coursework and, and sort of get situated. Um, after that, people switch over, as I said, into maybe they've gotten a fellowship, 
maybe they're re becoming a research assistant on someone's project or they're going to be TAing in different classes. And I think it's really through those interactions that people are kind of cementing that relationship with their advisor. All the way through the program, whoever the PhD program director is, and I'm the, the director at the moment, that person is always available for advising as well. So like I just had a Zoom call with our PhD students who are taking the qualifying exam, and we went over all of the ins and outs of how they need to study for that. I sign everyone's paperwork and I provide advice about um, course replacements and substitutions, credit hours, and I have like a big spreadsheet that I use to track everyone so I can make sure I know who's on maternity leave and who's not getting enough units and who we have to look after to make sure that they're making progress in the program. And we have another administrator that if you apply, you'll probably interact with quite a bit, Jim DeVera, and he and I work together really closely along with Maria Henke and the people in the graduate school to um, make sure everything is taken care of, all the milestones are being hit, all the funding packages are totally fine. Um, and yeah, so I think, you know, the advisor advisee relationship is totally idiosyncratic to the, the student and the faculty, um, but the kind of general support and advising is always there and it always comes from whoever the PhD program director is, as well as um, Maria Henke and her staff. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And can your advisor um, be the same person that you identified in your application as the, the faculty member that you want to work with? Yeah, sure. It could be. Wonderful. Like I said, normally during the visit is when we kind of really figure that out. I think those face-to-face -face meetings are important. I don't know how that's going to work this year exactly. We'll, we'll, we'll determine that. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, I think it, it bodes well for a student who's done their due diligence in researching the faculty and the program as well to make sure that, you know, it's kind of another positive indicator from our end that like, oh, this person knows how to like put information together, analyze the situation and come to a well-reasoned conclusion. So people, um, you know, if you kind of found a good fit with a faculty member, I would definitely highlight that uh, in the application material. And, and, and I wouldn't just say like, I'd be a great fit with Jennifer. I would say something more like, our interests are aligned because I'm really interested in how neighborhoods impact health and well-being over the adult life course, or I, you know, I'm fascinated by air pollution research and I work with a, a project in um, Pittsburgh or, you know, to be like kind of specific about it, I think that that's a um, good strategy probably. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And you mentioned briefly, obviously we don't know what's gonna happen with the interview process and the PhD visitation day um, when you get to come to our campus. Do you think um, with the current health situation going on, that's gonna affect our numbers for intake next year? I don't think so. Um, I mean, I would certainly fight to make sure that's not the case. Um, well, I mean, we could be, if we're talking about two different things. One is an economic issue and one is a, a kind of a more direct COVID issue. Um, I don't know if people are reluctant to start a PhD program now because of everything that's going on. That I, I couldn't say. I suspect that people's plans for um, completing a PhD are, are somewhat unaffected by what's going on because if you're thinking about a PhD, you're already kind of a long range planner and you've got, you know, ideas about when things are going to happen. Um, but if we're talking about funding, it is true that many universities are going to be experiencing some fallout from this economic downturn that we're all in and USC is not an exception. I will say that financially speaking, I do think that the School of Gerontology has, has been quite intelligent about things over the years. We're actually I think it, we're in a very good position um, with respect to the rest of the university. It doesn't mean that we're not also going to have to kind of tighten our belts fiscally. Um, but to my mind, our, that our PhD number, our enrollment numbers should be consistently around what we've always expected. And so we usually accept something between like somewhere between four and eight people. It kind of depends. Um, and as I said, the size of our cohorts are usually a function of how much kind of bandwidth a uh, faculty member has in terms of how many more people they can manage in their lab and who they can commit to funding. So, you know, the upside of that is that we provide a really supportive PhD experience for people and the downside is we don't end up with as big of cohorts as other programs might. Um, I actually think it's a better thing. I think our kind of one-on-one -on -one intense mentoring <laughs> over people's uh, careers has, has actually been good for folks. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Um, and then we have one question that's been submitted privately. Um, what is kind of the hardest aspect of the program and how do you guide your students through that part? Hmm. 
I guess I think that probably varies from student to student, but um, usually it's the transition between coursework and becoming someone who's capable of engaging in independent research. That's traditionally the hardest period for all grad students. I actually think the USC Graduate School and our program have done a pretty good job trying to make sure that that, that transition period is not quite so difficult. Um, but typically what happens is, you know, you've just come out of an undergraduate program, a master's program, and you've been a student the whole time. And when you become a PhD student, it's true, it's true that you're a student. But we do actually expect that right around year two or year three, you're going to start to make the transition. You won't really be a student anymore in the sense that you're kind of a passive receptacle for information. You're supposed to become a knowledge producer. Um, that's also when like all of the classes you've taken and statistical training or methods training, qualitative training, suddenly you have to kind of put that into action. You have to start collecting your own data or you have to start engaging in data analysis, writing papers. I think that can be a really difficult time for students. Um, usually what happens in programs is in between the qualifying exam and the dissertation proposal, they, people become untethered. They just sort of float away. Um, what the graduate school has required and what we do in gerontology is we actually require this kind of pre-proposal at the very end of the qualifying exam stage. And we use this as a way to try to bridge people so that almost immediately at the end of your coursework, you're already thinking about what your dissertation project is going to be. It doesn't have to be anything grandiose. It, they're usually pretty kind of minimal in terms of how well thought out they are because people haven't had a lot of time. Um, but it does mean that it's kind of given you a starting point and the faculty know as well, and that's important. So like we know like, oh, okay, this is what this person is going to be doing as they transition into the dissertation stage and we've had this meeting and now we know, you know, we have a schedule, we're gonna check in with them. Um, so I, I still think it's a really hard transition for students um, and there's no way around that. I think that's just kind of a function of what it takes to become a PhD level researcher, thinker, academic, intellectual. Wonderful. Thank you for that. So at this point in the panel, I am going to allow you to unmute yourself. So if you want to ask any questions, you're also still welcome to ask questions in the chat and I can ask Jennifer on your behalf or you can send them to me privately via email. Um, one last question for you then, Jennifer, is what advice would you give to future students and people that are interested in applying to the program? I think you should find a good fit for you. Um, I think people who are applying to PhD programs are, we're all sort of self-selected, very driven people and we have high and lofty expectations of ourselves and we're looking at something and we think we have to have that thing. Um, I would say just personally, I applied to a program in demography at UC Berkeley when I was trying to get into graduate school and I didn't get accepted there and I was devastated. Um, ended up going into Michigan and getting a degree in sociology there. And it, actually it turned out to be the best fit for me academically and personally being in the Midwest, Midwesterners are just the kindest people. Um, and I, but I look back and I think like, you know, the, when I got my rejection letter and I was in my car crying, if, I wish I could have gone back and told myself like, it's gonna turn out fine. Like you're gonna end up in a great place. And um, so I think, you know, it, think, things are really hard right now. And I know it's like everything's really uncertain for everyone, but I would say that you will probably end up in your best place. And you're not just applying to this program. I assume all of you are going to be applying to a lot of different programs, but you know, really look for the place that you think you can grow the most, that you're gonna be surrounded by people who are going to support you. Um, and of course, do everything you can to make sure you have a very strong application. Wonderful, thank you for those great words of wisdom. Um, again, I'm gonna place my email here in the chat. If you do have any questions, about anything that wasn't discussed or if you think about it at a later time, more than welcome to reach out to me via email. I wanna thank you all for your time today, um, listening to us. Oh, we have one more question that just came in. Um, for people that have say have been working um, in, in social work, in the medicine field, um, and haven't been in school for a long time, could you recommend who would be the best to write a letter of recommendation or to recommend them for the program? Um, yeah, I think, you know, if you find like an old professor who can't really say anything about your abilities, that's not gonna be a great recommendation for you. Uh, on the other hand, if you have a colleague who can talk about how you wrote memos and reports and how you have good analytical thinking skills, 
um, that that's a legitimate um, source of a recommendation. So basically, I don't know if people know what the recommendation forms look like, um, but in addition to writing the letter, the recommenders kind of fill out these ratings of people and they're rating you on some of your quantitative abilities, your writing skills, all of the kind of things that we look for uh, in the program. I mean, I think it's a standard form that the university uses, but we do look at those. Um, and I don't think that it's necessarily the case that only a professor could fill that out. Um, so it asks things about like, you know, whether you're good at uh, verbal communication, written communication, what are your strengths and weaknesses, things like that. So yeah, if you have like a boss or a supervisor who's really capable of evaluating your abilities and some abilities from non-academic settings transfer over really well to academic settings, you know, kind of like analytic thinking skills and attention to detail come in really handy actually um, when you're doing research. Mm -hmm. Great. And this is all online and on the application. The process will guide you. Um, we'll be talking about the application process more in depth on Friday at 9 a.m. It'll be the last uh, session in our panel series of the week. Um, do we have any other questions for Jennifer? You should have the ability to unmute yourself too if you'd like to say hi or ask a question personally. Okay, well, thank you all again for your time. Oh, I saw someone try to say something, but I think she couldn't unmute herself. Taylor? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear okay. you now. Okay, um, on the flip side of the previous question, um, I will be an incoming master's student and I was wondering like what I could do to be more proactive throughout my master's program to be a better candidate for the PhD program because like you were saying how there were no, like your PhD labs do not use like model organisms. So I was curious as to what I could do to like better myself for. I mean, if you're interested in the biology of aging program, then they do. Um, and they, we do have some PhD, we actually do have some master students who work in some of the labs of the faculty members in the biology of aging program. I don't think that that happens a lot. Uh, we do, a lot of master students work in the labs of the gerontology PhD program as well. Um, I don't know how they go about accomplishing that. They probably just make a meeting um, with the faculty member and see if there are any projects that they can get involved in. Um, I will say our master's programs are really well set up to prepare people for careers in aging. They're not necessarily, they're not designed to be research training programs. We do offer every, everyone is, not everyone, but most of the master's program requirements include this research methods class. Um, so that's a little bit of research training. I, actually, I think that's helpful because it shows that you've had training in, in research methods. Um, but usually, in, students want to be a little more competitive. They'll need to seek out additional kind of research opportunities to hone their skills. I also think, just by the way, in general, it's a good idea to see how research groups work to see if you want to do this for the next you know, five so years of your life. Like once you get onto the PhD track, you're kind of locked in. <laughs> like you've really made a commitment. It's it's not an easy path to get out of, as people will tell you. It's not impossible, obviously. Um, so it's I think it's a good idea to get research, kind of hands-on research experience in a research group, if if only just to know for yourself if that's really what you want to do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Denise. Hi, Jennifer. And thank you, Stephen, for coordinating this. This was excellent. Um, I'll definitely be participating in some of the other um, seminars. My question regarding aging, um, I, I really, to be honest with you, had never really known anything about the school or study of gerontology. I just, over the last five years, I've taken great interest in aging and caregiving. Um, and so one of the things you said today that really stuck out to me was a knowledge producer. You know, because I've, I've taught before at the college level, but because of how many people are aging in our community, um, as far as like the big boom of baby boomers, I just, I'm not sure if this is actually the best fit for me. So thank you for saying, like, you know, really look to see what works. Because what I've studied so far regarding gerontology, it seems like it would be a good fit, but I'm really interested in policy. 
um, I do it at the city government level and I want to do it at a higher level, um, state, federal, things like that. So, but I'll continue to do my research. I did read up on a couple of the faculty members and they seem like they work on policy too, but, um, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I would, uh, I would reach out to Reggie and Kate. So Reggie Tucker Saley and Kate Wilbur, because they both do policy, but it's not, they're not just doing policy. They're doing kind of research driven, um, research informed policy, but yeah, I mean, they do policy and we do have people um, who focus on policy. And like I said, um, we have had people who've gone on to work in government kind of policy uh, roles in government as well. Um, but I think this is an excellent opportunity for you to talk to people on the faculty who can kind of help you to understand what's your path and what's the best way for you to get, you know, from A to Z, basically. And it might be a PhD program, it might be some other kind of a program, it might be gerontology, it might be a policy program. Um, but I think Reggie and Kate would be two good people for you to talk to because they do, they do kind of embody that policy realm. Okay, thank you. And then Anne, did you have a question as well? No? Okay. Does anyone else have a question for Jennifer? Oh, Steve and I do. Okay, wonderful. Go ahead, Janelle. Uh, nice to see you all. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jennifer, for speaking, too. Um, I was wondering what makes USC so unique from other schools, because I was looking at Maryland, Baltimore, and Baltimore County, and then Penn State's um, Human Development Program. Um, and then UMass Boston. So what makes USC different from those types of schools? Mm -hmm. um, I think we're pretty different from the human development programs because we're all focused on aging. It, so we do think of aging in terms of a lifespan developmental paradigm, but um, you know, human development programs have people who study children and, and young adults, and then they might have some kind of more gerontology focused people. We are every one of us focused on aging. Now, that doesn't mean we all just study old people. Um, we study, you know, people across the adult age range, but we don't have any people studying children, for instance. Um, so because of that, you get a very intense, concentrated exposure to all kinds of aging research in coursework, in scientific seminars that we have. Um, basically, it's just throughout the program, it's all aging related. Um, in terms of like the Baltimore program, the um, program in Massachusetts, I would just say that um, the most unique part of our program, which I don't believe has any parallel anywhere, is that we do have this integration with the biologists as well. That seems to be a little odd because normally social scientists and biologists and certainly policy people and biologists don't interact very much. Um, I have found it to be a very rich intellectual experience because it's helped me to better understand science kind of more broadly, um, not just my very specific niche of work that I do. Um, but also the biologists offer us an opportunity to understand, you know, like how does the social environment get under the skin? What is stress and how does it get converted into these kind of physiological responses? Because we work with them and they help us understand that better, I think we are able to make more forceful arguments about how the social factors, for instance, the social determinants of health really matter, and then why we need to push on certain policy levers to um, support people better, because we can make those kind of social to biological, like cells to society connections, basically. Thank you. Wonderful. Any other? I had, yes, I did. Um, my name is Annabelle. I actually, I thank you so much for this session. I've, I've, I feel like I've gotten more insight as to what the program is and what it offers. But I wanted to, um, I'm so glad that Denise uh, commented because I, I was thinking, you know, let me ask if, if, I'm, if I'm also looking at the right thing. So, I work in the medical field. Um, I've been in public health for 10 years and now in uh, private health, like hospital health work um, and mental health um, for now four, four years and in Medicare, Medi-Cal health insurances. And um, my strive, my passion is to really help um, the, at the community level, but I, I keep in my mind, like what do I need to do to, to be able to do that? So I want to, I am passionate about research and I want to learn how to do research that can influence 
funding programs at community levels, at community health clinics, because I know that they do rely on a lot of grants and they rely on evidence-based research to write their grants. And I keep thinking like, I just, I need to do research for these communities to be able to access the proper funding and to be able to, you know, provide the evidence that shows that the, what the need is for these communities, cities, and at county levels. And I'm wondering if this is what this would do for me in, in, in this is what I want to do. Is that Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we have students and faculty who are very passionate about improving outcomes in communities, in their communities. Um, the only difference, though, is that we're really focused on doing that through research, right? So we're not, yeah. we're not out there doing like kind of community building or community work, but what we are doing is, for instance, um, like Susan and Gita knows, for instance, might try to understand how do you better inform certain communities like African American communities or Latino communities in their and, and the importance of end of life planning. Um, and so she might do a project where she creates kind of more culturally appropriate materials rather than always using the kind of same standard, you know, pervasive white uh, people materials yeah. that, that making like kind of culturally tailored and specific programming and intervention work and informational materials. But what we would do is we would do the research to see if it was actually effective, right? Rather than yeah. just kind of, a lot of work is done without much of an evidence base. Um, and so what the only difference here is that we're really incorporating research into it. But of course, a lot of people are doing the research not just to have research careers, but because they're very passionate about improving outcomes in communities. So it is, this is kind of what I'm looking for. Is that? Could be. <laughs> Could I be, yeah. I wasn't sure because I kept going in my mind, like, is this, am I going towards health? Should I go towards the health behavior part? And I feel like I've already done a lot of the community stuff and work and I want to, I know what the need is to find for them to have the research to, for, to create their grants and create and to feed it to, I don't know, I'm, I'm kind of nervous right now. but. <laughs> As, Anna, um, as Jennifer was talking about, a lot of our faculty members have that kind of joint and pointy. They have the specialties in other departments here at the university. And so you wanted to take classes within another department at the university. That's def definitely still a possibility as well. Okay. So you can work with your advisor, the committee, the faculty members to kind of really create um, your special interests in a project that's really close to what you want to do. Would, so I guess what I was saying, would you say that this is a program I should try, this is one I should try to apply for in, in a comparison to PhD and like, you know, I don't know, health psychology? I mean, I think people should apply kind of broadly so that you have options. Um, and I will say in my comments earlier about finding the perfect place for you, it's kind of hard for you to know until you've started really looking around, right? Yeah. And <clears throat> this is why we do that kind of in-person visit because we do want, and we've had students that have come to visit and they realize that they, they then go to another program, um, which is totally fine because at the end of the day, and by the way, we usually see those students at, like we've had students that have not come to our gerontology program, but they've gone to another one. And then we see them at GSA. Everyone is very friendly. We all get along quite well. So, um, you know, we're just trying to help people find their best path. And yeah, if you wanted to be doing like community organizing, like, the point is just that our program is not, you know, no, I that, that's just an research. example. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. like we're not well suited for that kind of um, that kind of work. But if you want research training and you want to apply it to communities specifically and to, um, you know, trying to understand issues in communities and solutions, then I do think that we have good training for that, assuming it's in, uh, related to aging, which is where our primary yes. strengths are, obviously. Okay. Thank you. Great. So as we come up here on the top of the hour, I want to thank you all again for those great questions listening to us. Um, we have run out of time. I want to give Jennifer a big thank you for uh, giving her time to answer all of your great questions today. And thank you for joining us. And we hope that you join us for our other sessions this week. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, all of you. Thank you. Take care. Stay safe. Thanks, Stephen.